There's a quote that every time I see it, it really makes me laugh. Maybe you've seen it too. It's attributed to Abraham Lincoln, and it says this, the problem with quotes found on the internet is that they are often not true. I don't want to spoil the surprise for you, but I'm pretty sure Abraham Lincoln didn't say that. But you know, we have a tendency to just accept something. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was a wise man, and that sounds like wise advice. Don't don't just accept a quote that you read somewhere. But Abraham Lincoln obviously never said it. And there's some things that sound like they would have come from William Shakespeare, and they didn't. And there's some things that sound like maybe Socrates or Plato said them, but they didn't. And there are some things that sound like it came from the Bible, but it didn't. And that's what this series is all about. It's simply called, Is That in the Bible? And in this series, we are really concerning ourselves with not necessarily phrases that sound biblical but aren't, but even sometimes the other way around, some phrases that we're saying, there's no way that that could be in the Bible, and it actually is. And so today, I want to explore with you a, this is our fourth installment in this series, And uh, so we've asked this on every one of these phrases. Is this in the Bible? Name it, claim it. Now, the simple answer is no. That phrase by itself is not in the Bible. And in all fairness to people who really promote this idea of I can see something I want, I can claim that I want it, and then God's going to give it to me because I've named it and I've claimed it, they don't even really use that phrase, name it, claim it. But what they do use is a couple of phrases from Jesus. For instance, they'll say things like this, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Or another phrase from Jesus, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Now, both of those phrases are indeed found in the Bible, but as you'll see in a couple of minutes here as we kind of lay this out, Those are not complete statements. They are partial statements that are really taken out of the context in which uh, Jesus spoke them. But I think that the people that make this claim that you can name something, you can claim something, you can say, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to get this thing, Um, I think that their motives may have started off with the best of intentions. I will will grant them that, that, that maybe their idea was, if a Christian looks good, it makes God look good. But what happens is they begin to focus on things like, Uh, personal comfort. I need to dress well. I need to drive the best car. I need to live in the best house. I need to fly a private jet. I need to never have any turmoil in my life, never have any sickness, never have any setbacks at all. And so um, I'm not going to claim any of those things. I'm only going to claim the good things because I want God to look good. And in the meantime, I want to look good too, and I want to feel good, and I want to have my life go good. Now, this is nothing new where people have struggled with this idea of if somebody calls themselves a Christian or they call themselves a follower of God and things aren't going well, how do we explain that? In fact, there's a whole branch of theology that has come up that is called theodicy. And notice the definition. This is the definition from the uh, the dictionary, a defense of God's goodness and omnipotence in view of the existence of evil. In other words, they're saying we need to defend God because we say that he's an all-good God, that he's an all-powerful God, and then we see bad things happening, and how come God won't step in there to take care of those things? And um, listen, let me let me just help you with something. God doesn't need our help um, to, uh, to try to explain him or try to uh, help him uh, with his image problem. He, he needs no assistance from us at all. But still, some of these scriptures that, that I've already referenced, and there's some other ones, that just don't seem to, to fit all together. I, I mean, you can go back to, most people will, will say that the book of Job was probably the first book of the Bible that was written. And the story of Job is really summed up it, it, like this, is Job's three friends that came to him said, look, we know how it's supposed to be. If you are a righteous man, 
things will go well for you. You will be blessed. And if you are a wicked man, things are going to go terrible for you. God's curse is going to be on your life. That's really the sum of those three friends of Job. That's their argument to Job the whole time. We just know that this is how it's supposed to be. And yet, we know if you if you read behind the scenes, now his friends didn't hear this, but behind the scenes, we read God saying, Job is a righteous man. There's there's nobody like him. And so their argument was we know to be false right from the beginning because we know what God has already said. But but here's these these friends of Job saying this is this is what's going on. I, I want to show you a couple other verses too, even in a little bit more of a modern setting. At the time that Jesus was born, we see the chief priests and the scribes are trying to make uh, the Messiah look good. They want to help God out. So if you remember the, the story of the birth of Jesus, that those wise men, those magi show up and they ask King Herod, we're looking for the king of the Jews that's just been born. Where do we find him? And so King Herod calls in the uh, chief priests and the scribes and says, what, what is this supposed to say? Now, they quote from the Old Testament book of Micah. And I'm going to put both verses up. I want you to see both of them because I want you to see what the chief priests and the scribes did. Okay, first of all, this verse that is on the top is uh, right from Micah. This is the Old Testament prophecy. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old from ancient times. And then this verse below, this is how the Old Testament or how the chief priests and scribes are quoting that Old Testament phrase. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, I want you to see really kind of this second phrase. Notice in Micah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, that Micah was saying Bethlehem is just a tiny little village. But look at how the chief priests and the scribes changed it. You are by no means least among the rulers of Israel. See, they were trying to make Jesus look good, or the Messiah. They're trying to make the Messiah look good. It just doesn't look good to have the Messiah come from some little town way over there that nobody hardly ever pays attention to. We don't really know anything about that. The Messiah is supposed to come from, you know, he's supposed to be noble and come in here as a conquering general and warrior. And um, to say that he came from Bethlehem, a town of really no note at all. And so they're trying to help him out. God, you might have an image problem here and we want to try to help you out. And I think, I think the same thing, these people that say, you know, I got to dress well, I've got to live well, I have to be well, I can never experience any kind of turmoil in my life at all, because if I do, that's going to make God somehow look bad. And so therefore I can find something I want, I can name it and I can claim it as my own. There'll never be any problems that'll come my way. And yet there's scriptures that really speak directly against this. In fact, let's look at some phrases from Jesus himself. Here's what Jesus said, sell your possessions and give to the poor. And he said, blessed are you when, not if, but when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then Jesus also said, in this world, you will, not you might, but you will have trouble. Then look at the words of the Apostle Paul. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. And what about Job? We mentioned him earlier. Two phrases from Job. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and notice this as well, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And then the next chapter of Job, his wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, 
Job did not sin in what he said. And then finally, the words of King Aguar in the Proverbs, two things I ask of you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Kind of sounds like what Jesus taught us to pray. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. So this idea of saying whatever I want to help me look good so that I can make God look good and he's not going to look good if I'm going through trouble, that really flies in the face of what other scripture verses say. Now, listen, this is by no means to say that God is uh, opposed to wealth. Um, You can read through the Old Testament accounts and you can see people like King David, King Solomon, God gave them wealth. Uh, Even Job that we've mentioned a couple of times, after he went through this trial, the Bible says that God gave Job double the wealth that he had before. Uh, If you read through the Gospels, you'll see that there were wealthy people who helped fund the ministry of Jesus. When you flip from the Gospels into the book of Acts, you'll see that there were people that were using their means, their wealth, to help uh, support the church and people in the church and and the missionary endeavors that that were taking place. So this is not an anti-wealth and anti-possession kind of thought. This is making sure that the possessions are not possessing us and that our focus is not on what I'm going to get and how I'm going to look in all of this. But the focus is on what does God say? What does his word say? So it's quite simply, as I said before, is that phrase, name it, claim it in the Bible, no, and neither is the idea behind it that we're only going to have good things there's not going to be any rough times that are going to come to the life of a Christian. Now, I, I, that's just one specific spot, I, I, one specific thought. I want to give you three ideas of how do we keep ourselves from getting caught up in these different falsehoods? How, how do we um, keep ourselves in a place where we are truly aligned to what God's Word says? Okay. So the first uh, thought that I would give you is this. We have to study the whole counsel of God's Word, the whole counsel of God's Word. And by that, what I mean is that um, we have both the Old Testament Scriptures, we have the New Testament Scriptures, we have the words of Jesus, we have the words of the apostles, but all of those words are all inspired by the same Holy Spirit. There is no contradiction in them. There is, there is no, well, one person says it this way and the other person says it this way, so which one do I listen to? There, there's not that kind of tug of war. If there's anything at all, there is a tension that brings balance, that that brings us into the place where we're supposed to try to remain and live so that God is glorified. And so we have to look at the whole counsel of God's Word. Let let me give you an example uh, uh, from—actually, a couple of examples from the life of Jesus— where uh, these same chief priests and scribes and Pharisees, the same religious leaders that throughout their life, they kept coming to Jesus. And I think, again, they were saying, you're not making God look good. In fact, that's how Paul uh, really started off as Saul, the uh, persecutor. That's what really what he was doing is he was saying to the Christians, you are not making God look good. Okay, And so uh, there was a proper way in their mind to do things. And so The day that we now celebrate as Palm Sunday, that day that Jesus rides into Jerusalem and people are waving those palm branches and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and Jesus rides into town and then he comes into the temple. And for the chief priests and the religious leaders, this was just not the way that things were supposed to be done and certainly not the way that the the Messiah would ever arrive at all. And so I want you to see this exchange and how Jesus addresses it and this idea of studying the whole counsel of God's word in Matthew chapter 21. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he, speaking of Jesus, the the things that he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, you know, this has got to be really rubbing them the wrong way. They're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. And they say to Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus, have you never read? Now, what an what uh, indictment that is. I mean, these are the chief priests, 
These are the scribes that are taking God's word and writing it down to be passed on to other people and other generations. These are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the ruling religious class. And he says to them, haven't you read the Bible? Haven't you read the scripture? Because he makes reference and then he quotes from the first two verses of Psalm chapter 8 and says, look, it's it's from children even that praise is going to come to the Messiah. And so, so Jesus addresses that. Let me show you another example in uh, Mark uh, chapter 12. The, the Sadducees come to Jesus, and I find this ironic that it's the Sadducees that are going to use this example, because the Sadducees um, didn't put a lot of emphasis on the spiritual life. They didn't believe in um, angels or spirits like that, and they certainly didn't believe in the resurrection. Once you were dead, you were dead in their minds, okay? And yet they come up with this example of Jesus, where they're trying to trip up Jesus, and they said, uh, let, let us ask you a question. At the resurrection, we want to know, um, how's this going to play out? And they use this example from the Old Testament law. They said there was a, a man and a woman who were married, and the man died without leaving any uh, children behind. There were no heirs to receive his estate. Now, in this culture, the women could not inherit that estate. And so what, back in the Old Testament law, it would say that the brother of the deceased husband would then marry that widow, and and then there would be children that could carry on his brother's name. And they use this outlandish example. They say, well, what if the first brother died, and the second brother died, and the third brother died, and the fourth, and they go on through this whole list. They make it really outlandish, highly unlikely that it would ever happen. And they say, when, now, when the resurrection takes place, remember, they don't believe in the resurrection, but when the resurrection takes place, whose wife is she going to be at that point? And listen to Jesus's response, <laughs> and he pulls no punches here, are you not in error? You're wrong because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Again, he says, you haven't even really read the full counsel of God's word, because then he says, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. And he says, now, by the way, since you mentioned resurrection, now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses so he's saying, listen, guys, have you read the scripture or not? Okay, Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. living. And then listen to his closing words, you are badly mistaken. They were mistaken because they were kind of cherry picking. They, they, would, they would go through much like kind of the name it, claim it sort of thing. They'd go through and say, well, let me just take this one phrase and let me just pull out this one phrase and and see what I can do with that one thing. And Jesus says, no, let's look at the full counsel of God's word. Here's where we have the help. I had mentioned to you um, that all of the words of the Bible are all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus gives us this great promise in John chapter 16. He says, I have much more to say to you than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So the same Holy Spirit that inspired all the words of this Bible is the same Holy Spirit that can then illuminate it to our hearts. But we, it's our responsibility to actually start reading this word. We can't just, um, by osmosis, just get it to kind of, it'll seep into our minds. And, and you can't get it just by showing up in church and just listening to a pastor's sermon. You need to read it for yourself, but read the full counsel of God's word. Now, one of the things I would just encourage you to do, this Bible that I have right here is a study Bible which means that there's a lot of phrases in here that'll have little footnote marks next to them. And then in my Bible, it's down this center column in between the two columns of Scripture. Other Bibles might have it down at the bottom, but it's a cross-reference. So if I'm here in the New Testament, so I'm, I'm here in John chapter 16, I can read a couple of these 
uh, references, and it'll give me some other places to look, maybe in some of the other places in the New Testament, or maybe some of the places in the Old Testament, where that same thought or that same idea appears. Utilize those kind of study tools to help you be able to study the whole counsel of God's Word. Not just the pet phrases, but the whole counsel. And that will help guard you from the error. Now, the second thing that I think is really important is this phrase, context is king. Context is king. You have to understand the setting in which the words are spoken. And I'm sure that you know that in your own life, you know, you'll hear somebody say something, you're like, what did you say? And then when they give you the background, well, I said it because this was going on. You're like, oh, okay, that makes a lot more sense. Then we can do the same thing with the Bible. We, we can't just say, I have a good idea of the way things should be. Let me go see if I can find a scripture that might back that up. Because I'm going to have a tendency to just look for a phrase and probably lift it out of its context uh, in order to make it say what I want it to say. So here's two more theological terms that, that we need to be aware of. The first one is this, eisegesis means reading into the word. That means I come to the Bible with an idea already in my mind of the way things should be, and then I'm looking for the verse to make my point. That is going to lead me into error. But the second word is exegesis, and I've defined it as letting the word read us. So instead of me coming and saying, here's my idea, let me go read the Bible, it is me just saying, Lord, I, I want to just have an open heart. I want to have an open mind. As I come now to read the Bible, I want you to speak to me the truths that I need to hear from your word. And, and I'm just receiving what the spirit of truth is illuminating to my life. And then, um, and then I want to then step back and make sure that does that line up with the whole counsel of God's word? I'm not just reading just one phrase right here and pulling that out. So, so that's how we make sure that we keep these things in context. So let me give you just two quick examples, um, specifically on this idea of the name it, claim it. There's two phrases that I told you earlier that that they would kind of uh, use. One is from uh, John chapter 14, verse 3, or excuse me, verse 13, where they would say, whatever you ask in my name, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask in my name. Uh, but let me read the full verse so we even just get the context of this verse. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And then the next verse, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. But the context is, he says, I want you to ask, is it something that, that would align with my nature, with the character of my life? And is it something that is going to bring God glory? Both of those things are requirements. Also then in John chapter 15, verse 7, this is one of the other phrases that they use, um, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. But again, this whole thing, starting in John John chapter 15, verse 1, is Jesus talking about he is the vine and we're the branches, and we abide in him, we stay connected in him, and that's how our lives become fruitful. So now let me read all of verse number 7, not just that one phrase. If you remain in me, if you're abiding in me as a branch is into the vine, and my words remain in you, the full counsel of God's word remains in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So what What really, notice the, the context here, though. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, what, you will do great things? No, you will ask. So what, what this context really is, is Jesus is saying, if you're abiding in me as firmly as a branch is remaining uh, attached to the vine, attached to the trunk, and that sap from the from the plant is flowing through, the natural uh, occurrence is for that branch to then bud and blossom. Okay? It's the same thing in our lives. When we stay con connected to Jesus, the natural thing is that we will ask Jesus. We will just be in regular communion with him. It's not like we say, okay, now I need to be attached because I I'm going to ask a prayer or I'm going to claim something for myself. But I stay in contact with him. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will ask. The, the asking is what, what it, not the receiving, but the asking, the, the ongoing dialogue. So the first thing that we have to do is make sure that we're studying the full counsel of God's word. 
The second thing that we have to do is make sure that we understand the context. Context is king. And then the third thing that I would add is this. I want you to understand the right terms that you're using. And so let me let me define for you what I mean by those terms. Okay, Biblical means that the Bible has said yes to it. The Bible has said this is what you're supposed to do. Unbiblical means the Bible has specifically said, no, this is something that you are not supposed to do as a follower of Jesus Christ. But then there's this category that's non-biblical, and that's where the Bible doesn't say anything explicitly about it. It doesn't say yes, and it doesn't say no. In fact, the Bible may not even mention it at all. Let me give you just a really simple example. When somebody says to me, this is how you're supposed to celebrate Christmas, what does the Bible say about celebrating Christmas? Doesn't mention it. Or if somebody says to me, this is what's supposed to take place in a church service. When, when you get together and you're having a church service, these are the things that have to be in that church service. Does the Bible specifically say that? So these are non-biblical issues. Now listen, non-biblical issues aren't necessarily wrong. But here's what the problem become, where the problem comes in. Jesus a couple times had conversations with the Pharisees about what he called your traditions. These things that you have just handed down. They're not biblical and they're not unbiblical. They're just traditions. They're the way that you're doing things. But the Pharisees had taken those non-biblical things and had elevated them to biblical status. Now, the danger is, when, if I do that in my life, if I take something that the Bible does not mention at all, a non-biblical thing, and I give it the weight of a biblical statement, then that opens the door for my attitudes or my actions to become unbiblical. You see what's, let me give you that example with that, those Pharisees again. They said, okay, one of our traditions is you have to wash your hands this way. The Bible doesn't say that, but they made it a biblical thing. And then when people didn't do it that way, then in their hearts, they looked down on them. They excluded them. They would push them out of the temple. They would view them as second-class citizens, not worthy to receive God's blessing. That became something very unbiblical, something that God specifically told us not to do in the way that we treat other people. And that's the danger of taking non-biblical things and trying to make them sound biblical. So this isn't just like uh, when we're doing this series. It's, it's not just a cute phrase, is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's, it could become dangerous for us if we take something that is non-biblical and we make it biblical. Then it's setting us up for something that could be unbiblical, something that specifically God says no about. So, friends, let me just recap again. Uh, This phrase, name it, claim it, is not in the Bible. These phrases that people have pulled uh, to try to make it sound, I'll do whatever you ask in my name, I'll give you whatever you ask for if you just say in the name of Jesus, those are things that have been taken out of context. God is sovereign. We don't tell him what to do. We don't say, God, this is what I demand, and this is what you're going to do. But in this context of John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you can ask. Then you're just, the asking is just going to be a natural thing. It's all about abiding in Jesus. It's all about coming into his word and abiding in his word and, and, and soaking in that. Not coming to it with my own ideas of what it's supposed to say, but coming to it. And I, before I read my Bible in the morning in my personal devotion time, I quote a prayer or I make it a prayer from Psalm uh, chapter 119, open my eyes to see wonderful things in your word. That's what I pray before I go to read the Bible for my own personal devotion time. I say, I don't want to come with any preconceived ideas. I don't want to come with an agenda. I just want to say, what do you have to say to me today? The same Holy Spirit that inspired these words are then the Spirit that's going to illuminate them to my heart. It's also the same Holy Spirit that is going to make you feel uneasy when you hear somebody say something that's not in the Bible and you may not even be able to say, well, according to this chapter, this verse, um, you know, that's, but, but you just, you feel that it's the same Holy Spirit that's grieving over the fact 
that words are being attributed to him that he never inspired. So let's be very careful about that. If you have other questions, other phrases where you say, I wonder if that's in the Bible, leave them as a comment below. Very well could be a topic that we're going to address in an upcoming episode of Is That in the Bible? I'd love to be able to continue the dialogue with you. So just uh, reach out to me in a variety of different ways, and I promise I'll get back to you. I love you, friends. May God bless you this week.